if you've been living under a rock in the past, I don't know how many years that you've never heard of Tom Johnson, uh, please check out his uh, web page uh, or website, or I don't even, it's more knowledge base at this point. I'd rather be writing or uh, subscribe to his newsletter. Um, one of my favorite reads from Tom, and I think you have educated more technical writers than most universities out there. So thank you for that and looking forward to the presentation. All right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm gonna talk a little bit about prompt engineering techniques. And I kind of hate the term prompt engineering because it, it, I don't know, it seems so spammy and so on, but I really am drawn to using these tools to write. So that's sort of the term that it, that is this domain. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna go through five kind of techniques or five kind of steps. If, if there is a process for using AI to write docs um, that I think is sort of working for me, it's these. You gather source material, you decide on a template, you go section by section, you error check the output and review with experts. I recently had a huge doc project at work. Uh, we had this SDK that had like seven different APIs in it, had a really short timeline. Um, and we, we had to crank out like minimal, minimum viable documentation that it included, you know, overviews, reference material, some basic setup. And uh, we used more or less this process to write a bunch of these overviews and other content and it worked it worked pretty well. Um, so I'm gonna just talk through these these techniques and explain kind of what's working for me, what I think is like the, the tips and tricks for actually getting like usable output from an LLM and how you can apply it. And I'm super excited about this topic. I, I love I love just chatting about AI. I'm, I, there's an AI, there's a lot of AI groups at my work and you know there's a lot of enthusiasm in this space and experimentation it's kind of a fun time to just to to be in techcom all right so the first the first step is to gather a bunch of source material and usually when i'm talking with other tech writers who are skeptical about ai their skepticism is basically well I'm writing something that hasn't doesn't have any documentation anywhere. I'm creating the first instance of it. So how can an LLM possibly help me write it? You know, wh which seems on the surface like a valid sort of uh, argument, but really any project that you're documenting usually has a tome of internal documentation. You've got engineering designs, one pagers, product uh, definitions, Every company has their own little nomenclature about all this like software development methodology, paperwork, basically, that people have to do. Uh, so so there is a lot of material. It's just internal material about the product. Um, but the first step is to just gather all this stuff up. I usually have a, a doc plan and I start collecting links and just get as much relevant material that I can find. Um, You'll also need uh, some kind of access to an LLM with a large context window. Let's say you gather 100 pages of material. And I'm including here potentially like a, a reference. Maybe you have like a, a reference documentation that you can include in this. You know, usually at, at the point where I'm jumping in to document something, developers have uh, some kind of reference material that, that's a starting point. And it's a tremendous addition to the source material. I'll also meet with SMEs and ask them lots of questions, and then I'll use AI to transcribe uh, the meeting. I have a special sort of technique that I do with that um, that gets a ton of rich detail from the meeting, uh, way more than any kind of just uh, literal translation uh, or literal transcription of the meeting. By the way, I have a site, I'd rather be writing.com, as Laura said, where you can find more info about all this. And I put little short links uh, to this content here. So after, uh, honestly, I uh, I will just open up a Google Doc and paste all this stuff in there. Uh, so after I have like as much information as I can find, keeping in mind quality is better than quantity, um, I'm ready to move to the next step which is figure out what the shape of this thing should look like. What template should, should the AI follow? 
for an API overview, uh, we had a very specific template. We had we wanted all the sections to look like they belonged to a collection. So they answered the same kind of questions, you know, like, what is this API? What do you do with it? Uh, how does it work? That kind of stuff. Um, but uh, as you know, there are lots of different templates for docs. A how-to has a certain shape, a reference has a certain shape, and your docs probably have certain shapes. Like, how do you, how do you, set up authorization or something. Uh, you can even reverse engineer the templates, you know, find a doc you like and ask AI to kind of reverse engineer the prompt that would yield that kind of output. Um, I've got a tutorial on that down here. It actually works surprisingly well. Um, you, you can you can get very detailed about each of these sections in the template, you know, like, hey, in this, in this uh, overview, it should be a few sentences long. Uh, it should uh, have this sort of perspective and tone and so on. And you can define details at, at each section of the template if you're so inclined. A lot of times products don't really uh, always fit into a standard template. They have their own shape of information based on their unique properties and, and how they work. So you have to be somewhat flexible on the template. Um, there is a, a project that does have a lot of templates. If you're looking for uh, like something as a starting point, the, the Good Docs project, I always plug that. I also have a bunch of material on my site that kind of talks through the different sections. But you want to have some template because this is going to make the output just look and feel more like what you expect in documentation. Um, and and I find that the the LLMs just write better when you tell it, hey. Uh, this is the material I need, you know, look through the source material and you're going to find info to fit this stuff or this, this part of the template. It just works better. Okay. Moving on to the third step, go section by section. This right here is my biggest like revelation about how to use the LLMs. I, I first discovered this when I was trying to uh, clean up meeting notes. I had a, uh, meeting notes that, you know, had whatever, whatever the transcription was, like five, 10 pages of, of just, you know, uh, verbatim content. And I initially tried just having AI clean it up, but the outputs were always really short. They were like 500 words. And I, I was like, well, the meeting was a lot longer. There was more detail. Why is this all being truncated? Well, the, the output of a lot of LLMs um, has a limit. It's, it varies by what tool you're using, you know, what model uh, and how long each model can kind of uh, uh, generate output. But if you go section by section, you will get much richer detail. So for the meeting notes, uh, the prompt that I use goes something like this. Um, from this transcript, identify the major themes discussed and just provide a list of them and the AI will spit out like seven different themes. And then with each successive prompt, I say, okay, for this first theme, I want you to uh, expand out all, all the detail, maybe uh, pick out a quote if, if something helps or you know, really try to add a bunch of rich detail, okay? And then after it does that, it will max out its token limit if you can. If you can. Uh, and then you say, now do the same for the next theme. And then the next theme. So it, it's a lot more tedious this way, obviously, but the end result is that you get a ton of great, rich detail. I've sent this to engineers after meetings and they're they're blown away by it. They're like, oh my God, like that's scary good. Um, so I was doing this with meetings and of course meetings then become the source material that informs the documentation. But you also do this with templates too. You know, instead of saying, hey, okay, I've got this API overview. Now I want you to, to just like fill it out, you know, with all the information from the source. That's not going to work as well as if you pick out the first section and say, okay, uh, I'm gonna have you do this whole template, but we're gonna go section by section. So for this first API overview section, you know, who is this API for? I want you to um, write that part and then go to the next section and ask it to write that next section and so on. If you proceed section by section, 
oh my gosh, it's a game changer. Uh, it's like a hundred percent difference in the, in the level of detail quality and just kind of richness of it all. This approach really um, aligns with a prompting technique called chain of thought, where instead of trying to um, ask an AI just for an answer to a problem, you have it think through a problem with kind of a series of questions. You know, like, hey, uh, let's say you were trying to just brainstorm about an API overview. You could start by saying, you know, what is this API for? And then based on that answer, you come up with the next question and you, you and then based on that answer, the next question, and you kind of think through this, this reasoning and the outputs from chain of thought prompting is just so much uh, superior to, to other approaches. And that's the, the section by section approach that I'm describing here. So if you get nothing else from this, just remember, Tom said, it's much better if you go section by section. Um, all right. The fourth step, once you have an output, right, you've, you've gone through section by section, you've gathered up a bunch of material. Now you can actually try some error checking. And this is this is fun. Um, <clears throat> basically, this, this step involves asking the AI to uh, check the draft output against all the source material. And amazingly, um, uh, in my experience, a lot of times it catches errors here and there. Um, especially if you go section by section and you say, hey, for this section, I want you to check um, uh, this, the accuracy of this content by looking at the source material. You can also specialize the error checking. Maybe you want to do a check for grammar errors. Maybe you want to do a check for product names or um, some other kind of checks for uh, code samples or something like you can really make it make it much more specialized and when you do those specialized error checking uh, error checks uh, the quality is a lot better um, finally there is kind of a big flaw in this whole process and that's uh, if you're checking the output against uh, like a source material the quality is really going to depend on your source material if your source material is completely slanted towards a certain direction that doesn't reflect what your documentation should be, then, then it's going to be problematic. Um, I had this problem. Uh, we, we were, um, the project team was working on some APIs that were kind of like uh, variants of existing APIs. And so most of the internal material was focused around the features they were adding, but the documentation needed to reflect like, the whole API, not just these new features that were being added. So you can see how like the source material can be biased or slanted. And that that kind of unstated context can can uh, bite you sort of um, in the output. Even so, it's really good. I feel like it gets at least 80% there. And when choosing between like, do I want to get 80% of the way into this draft um, and then try to fight my way through the last 20%? Or do I want to write it all from scratch? The answer has been resoundingly, I will take the 80% even with its problems and then just work from there. And that's coming from somebody who actually really enjoys writing. So uh, I'm just talking about documentation, by the way, not really talking about other more creative forms here. Okay, finally, this last step, reviewing uh, with experts. This is where it becomes somewhat problematic. If you are trying to evaluate the output, but you don't have expertise in the prop in the in the um, API, well, it's going to be problematic. Like, for example, I asked AI to convert a Python code sample to a Kotlin code sample, and I thought, oh, this is great. But then I realized, wait a minute, I don't actually I don't actually know Kotlin well enough to evaluate this. <laughs> so I have no idea if this is bogus or not. So I have to like, you know, refine, track down people who actually have knowledge, both of the product and the language and so on, and try to get them to review it. And of course, um, that usually involves testing the code. Nobody wants to sign their name to potentially bogus code without testing it. This is where the slowdown happens, right? Um, and it's, it's a lot easier to sort of review conceptual material with like a product manager because they just know immediately there's no need to really test something 
um, and you can ramp up pretty easily on conceptual material as well for depending upon the topic but um, trying to <clears throat> make sure everything is accurate and track down who are the right people to to review something uh, getting them to review it this is where it slips back into normal documentation mode um, I've been trying to figure out like how how could I use AI to really kind of like expedite the review process? And that's something I'm still working on. But one thing that is kind of fun is that if an expert says, a subject matter expert says, hey, this paragraph, uh, this needs to be changed in such and such way, you don't have to manually go and do it. You just basically take that paragraph into your same LLM session and uh, say, hey, this paragraph needs improving. Here's what a reviewer said. Can you make the change? Bam, done. Uh, so you can really kind of speed through the review. Um, uh, honestly, where I find the most slowdown is just like having to ping people and say, hey, hey, this is ready for you. Hey, when do you think you can review this? Hey, we need your feedback. Then the other problem is that reviewers are very specialized. So somebody who, who might like give you the thumbs up on a docu document might be just saying, I don't have any issues with it. The parts that I know, these sections look good, but I don't know about all the other parts of this, but I'm going to give you a thumbs up. And if you're the writer, you may think, oh, great. The reviewer has completely vetted and verified everything, and now I can publish. Well, that's probably a fiction. Uh, you might have to really uh, verify how much the SME actually knows uh, about, about the content to verify all of it. Okay, so that's my process basically so far. It seems to be working really well. And um, uh, it's not it's not a one-click thing. You know, it's gathering all that information, figuring out the shape of it, going section by section. This is, this is kind of tedious sometimes. I'm still gathering it, getting all my ducks in a row and, and so on to create a bunch of code tutorials. I know that if I just jumped into it now, it, the output wouldn't be good, right? I have to... I have to gather up a lot of info first and figure out what I want it to look like before I'm going to have a successful kind of outcome with the LLM. My blog at ratherbewriting.com has a bunch of info on prompt engineering. Uh, definitely uh, check that out. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm checking to see if uh, I'm just sharing one tab, not the whole screen. But if you go on up to tech writer plus AI. There's a whole section on prompt engineering. I'm adding more info there. My hope is to expand that out to 20 or more topics and uh, and just really have techniques that are tried and tested that actually work and um, which people can implement to write docs better. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dom. Um, really quick questions. Um, I'm going to rephrase one of them. Do you have a process for um, using the AI to vet your source material to spot inconsistencies before you give you accept it as truth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me um, okay. Let me share a little bit more of the the prompts because I actually do have prompts that you can just plug in for that. Uh, if you come down here to error checking the output. Um, you can see <clears throat> some sample prompts. Um, you are an expert fact checker. Your task is to ensure the accuracy of the documentation. The source material is the authoritative source of the truth. Actually, this this error checking prompt was AI generated as well, but uh, it actually works pretty well. So carefully compare the documentation against the source material. Look for factual errors, invented info, omissions. Um, yeah, so try this. I've had good luck with this, surprisingly. And uh, uh, again, it relies on having a bunch of source material, which ties back to the whole rag techniques in a more manual way. But, um, I, and I save my sessions too. I might not do this all at once. Uh, save a link to the session, jump back into it, and kind of have a ready, ready made uh, mode to uh, just extract knowledge and so on. You really need, by, by the way, powerful LLMs make a huge difference. Um, I'm able to experiment with lots of different models of LLMs. And yeah, when my favorite models are not are not available, I'm like, do I even bother? Uh, so uh, 
that is only going to get better and better as longer token contexts become available. Uh, it is literally mind blowing. Um, so uh, the more info, info you can gather in the source, you can really put that to use. You're not limited by a really short <clears throat> context window, but you have um, a lot of information at your disposal. It makes all the difference. While you have this open, could you also point to um, maybe where you in specifically name uh, the LLMs uh, that you recommend for this or that particular <clears throat> case? Yeah, I've been generic about that. I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, um, I would it what LLMs you can use depends on your company, your mm -hmm. privacy policies, security policies. Uh, Gemini, Claude, ChatGPT, these are amazing. So um, if you have access to them and you're allowed to use them, great. That's what I would totally recommend. Um, but honestly, there are lots of lots of different LLMs mm -hmm. and they're always changing and some might suit your purposes better. But I don't I don't get into a specific like <clears throat> LLM in the course. I try to keep it general. Mm -hmm. So more like the choice heuristics. More like the what? The choice heuristics? The heuristics of what dimensions do you decide on your choices? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you keep track of doc updates without going crazy? Do you have a process for that? Keeping track of doc updates? Mm -hmm. like, this is a question from Vera, mm -hmm. and it got several votes. So people are interested. How do you do that? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we use Google Docs a lot for drafts, and it works really well. Uh, just like comment threads on the sides of different sections that might need, I don't know, more investigation. Uh, it's just, <clears throat> I usually start in Google Docs if I anticipate a lot of feedback, especially if like they're, they're non-technical people reviewing things, and then I'll migrate it into um, a system that can capture diffs and, and do more of a code review. Um, but how do I keep track of, of that, um, yeah, I don't really have a special system there. So, Tom, thank you very much.